video I did, which was on the business model of youth transitioning, I argued that the gender identity phenomena is not a social contagion or a youth generational rebellion or anything like that. This is essentially uh, a market. Um, it's a business that's driving it. And what I want to talk about in this video is want to have a look at a couple of things. One, I want to look at who is influencing um, the gender identity uh, market, particularly putting gender identity ideology laws into place, and who is embedding gender identity into culture, and who are these people, who are the major drivers and influencers, and what are the core goals that they are driving to make gender identity ideology embedded into our culture. So that's the video, please watch if you before watching this one. It's only nine minutes long. This one's a bit longer because I really want to deep dive into these organizations. So what are the major change agents for embedding gender identity ideology in university, schools, government and corporate corporate organizations? Because this is where you kick off culture change. So I use the methodology of the startups because essentially when I looked at the business of the youth transition industry, it is following the model of the startup, which is not surprising because most industries do today. No longer is the startup methodology um, something for startups because it produces unicorns like, you know, Airbnb and Uber and Dropbox and Canva and Atlassian, etc. It makes a one size fits all uh, model that's hugely scalable. Um, built around identity marketing, built around um, certain types of branding, subscription models, freemium models, premium models, all those sort of things that make huge growth. So it's a perfect model to follow, particularly uh, considering who's involved in this industry. So, but industries don't stay startups forever anyway. They become large and they expand and they become entrenched into culture. So I wanna talk about the challenges the youth transition industry is has to meet to embed gender ideology into culture. And this is a change management process, a cultural change management process. My background has been considerable years spent in training and change management in the tech startup and a whole bunch of other uh, related um, skill sets around assessing new products going to market and, and system modeling and um, how to bring about cultural change in an organization from the very top all the way down to the bottom. So when you're doing that, when you're becoming a change agent, there's some things to consider. And in this case, the things to consider with the um, getting gender identity ideology embedded into the culture is reframing our world view. So for example, how, what, the reframe is for the um, gender identity ideology is that sex is not binary, it's not male and female. Um, bi biology doesn't relate to being a man or woman. Men can just declare themselves a woman one day and they're a woman. So reframing the worldview that sex instead is a spectrum is a goal. You know, Another major goal is you want to keep growing the consumer base, um, which is the youth transitioning, people transitioning. Um, through laws and you do that through laws and sanctions and rewards and um, that kind of thing then you want to silence always want to silence dissent you want to silence those people who are, are, are your adversaries who are bringing up all the negative consequences of gender identity ideology on schools and children and um, and on homosexuals and bisexual people and autistic people you want to shut those people down and then of course, what's at the behind this, because it's based around gender identity, ideology, marketing, branding, this is all feeling and personality stuff, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's all around the idea space. You want to ensure compliance with this ideology and attitude and behavior through new sanctions, laws and norms. You want it going from the top all the way down to the bottom. You want rewards for transitioners and allies, and all this is is making it so that you've got longevity in the marketplace. So what I wanna talk about is the how of it. I want you guys to go away and understand the stuff that people in the space who deal with cultural change, what we're seeing. 
uh, because this is what's being done. What, what you need to understand that all products are not the same. You know, if I'm selling a pen or if I'm selling a, a mouse or, you know, clothing or hat or whatever, that's not the same thing as those products require a cultural shift in how you and everybody else in an organization does something. It's not like buying products like tables and chairs and stuff, you know. So an example of what I mean comes out of the early 80s. Um, and that was with the introduction of um, software and PCs and Macs, etc. to the general public, particularly to the workforce. You know, in the early days, you know, around the early 80s and 70s, etc., you know, accountants were doing things with balance sheets and um, academics and writers and journalists were typing on typewriters. Um, you know, graphic artists use just paint and pen and paper, etc. So then when you bring in software, you know, operating systems like Windows 3.0, 3.1 when it came in and um, packages like Word, Excel and PowerPoint and Publisher, etc. Wow, it changed the way people thought. It was a huge cultural shift. It changed work processes. It significantly reduced time to do things. And at least you were there. This was major big stuff. It was huge progressive stuff. You know, the time it took to do something. And then all the challenges around the common person using technology that was really in the space of, you know, ticky ticky people and scientists and all stuff that they had in their head used, all that kind of thing. So there was a lot of fear about this space, a lot of fear about changing processes you do every day to this new stuff, you know. So training involved not just learning the software and learning how to use a PC, etc., but it was also changing attitudes and removing fears and getting people confident and pep talks and also all designed to create an ecosystem that supported this new change and all designed and focused on you, the user, uh, on how to be part of this culture because they wanted you to use all those things. So if you were a software training consultant back then, which I was, um, you were one of the ecosystem. That's an ecosystem you're looking at at the moment, or my attempt at one. You were looking at uh, being one of the change agents, you know, um, and you worked with both sides. You worked with the client side, their organizations, schools, corporates, education, etc. And you worked with the, um, the, the product itself, you know, Microsoft, the software. Some, uh, you work with the systems to make it work, PCs and Macs, etc. And you work with the salespeople of all those things. You know, in those days, you didn't download software from the internet. You bought it in a box from a company like Harvey Norman over here in Australia, you know. And you got rewarded for this. Usually um, people would choose young salespeople, as I were, because you're young and you're enthusiastic and this was brand new and it was progressive and it was changing the world and all that kind of stuff. So you're fully into it and you got rewarded with um, pep talks and going to all these marketing events with alcohol and flash nibblies and goodie bags and, you know, and you're really important because you're making all these changes and stuff, you know. Um, and then you worked with the cult, you worked with the organizations and you um, got you got them to get um, incentives like discounts on the products because of bulk purchase or if people um, got trained up on the products and they got certificates and then the company would provide you discounts because of that because you're all getting good at using the software and, and getting on board with all this technology and stuff and everything, you know. And then you looked at having to create language now for this new culture so that everybody understood each other and you know what you're talking about when you're talking about these things and shape it in a certain kind of way, you know. You got a certification process set up. So checking to see that did you actually know how to use this stuff. But also you tend to internally human resources and training departments would make uh, awards for jumping on board first or, you know, being a first adopter and how well you were doing and they would um, give pep speeches. As a change agent, I had to go and talk to the Ministry of Education when I was dealing with the government, major government departments like Department of Education, Training and Coordination, Industrial Relations, blah, 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 all those people. 
to get them familiar with um, what's going to happen across the board of New South Wales and how we're going to do it and all that kind of stuff. And then you also talk to all the levels down, the heads of departments and the managers and then the training consultants themselves and the HR themselves, etc. So pep talks and getting them to give pep talks and making posters and all very exciting stuff. So this is actually, actually there's still the same process. It's an, it's, I, I can use, I use it as an analogy, but really it's exactly the same process that's happening today because it's a tried and true method of embedding uh, a, a change into culture, you know. So I'm going to argue that the products that go with the gender identity ideology at the branding of it, of course, are puberty blockers, uh, cross-sex hormones, those that belong to the, um, you know, the product makers, which is your pharmaceuticals, um, your product enablers, of course, your medical organizations that hand the stuff out. Um, you've got uh, organizations, um, in this case, um, making laws. Um, like Denton's, you've got other organizations that are marketing it, which is um, act, uh, trans activists, and then you've got um, people who are dealing with the change management of this whole process. So what you're looking at there on the screen at the moment, I want to go and deep dive in each one of these groups. And even though these groups have expanded, these are the core that are driving it, um, plus the local trans lobby um, groups driving internationally, and, the, and our local trans lobbies are um, uh, piggybacking off all that to drive it locally here in Australia. So our first group is the young sales training consultants, as it were, young marketing consultants, as it were, and change agents, which is the key one that kicked this off was Iglio, which is your um, international lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex youth and student organization. Um, they didn't add the extra letters in when they first started. Those letters keep on adding, so I think it will stay the same as the name. Okay, they serve as a change agents to this ecosystem, you know. Um, they're young. You never get them older than 30 sitting on the board, so they're between 18 and 30, and that 18 and 25 particular age bracket is perfect. Uh, for progression and excitement and enthusiasm and all that kind of bizarre. So in many ways also the startup model methodology works with these kind of young people because they're very much like the young people that set up startups in the technology space. You know, they don't have any money, they don't have any time, they don't have any admin, they don't have any patience, um, they have limited skills. Um, so they cross skill with each other in our local startup that I work in. You know, we cross skill uh, both locally in Sydney and also internationally. Um, so we can get the expertise in the areas that we need to be competent to get our idea to the market. So startup cultures are highly collaborative. The TRA, for example, are, are, are training and recruiting all people all over the world. And everyone is learning from each other. Um, and that's in order so they can be highly skilled and successful. Now, when the young startups and also the case with these TRA show up to be um, useful or that they might be running a winning idea or that they're doing something that relates to um, uh, experienced mentors, investors and large corporate accounts and companies, they'll come in offering expertise in a whole range of areas to get that startup or the TRA's idea to market and then at the same time it benefits the products that they're selling. So Eaglio attracted some major, major players. Denton's who's the worldwide largest lawyer firm in the world and they have clients like Stryker Medical Corp run by John Stryker who is a trans woman and I think also Pritzker, uh, with Colonel Jennifer Pritzker, another trans woman. There's three major trans women that are pushing this industry through pharmaceutical organizations. And uh, Thompson Reuter, who, um, who collaborated with Dentons, and Ilga, um, and who uh, provide, Ilga provides training around the change management, project management, product development, recruitment space. Let's have a look a bit further. 
So Ilga is a bit of a concern because um, the Ilga world was um, excluded from the United Nations ECOSOC status until about 10 years ago because of its past links with several pedophile organizations, PI, uh, Pedophile International Exchange, and NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association. Look, it disputes its links to pedophilia. Um, I would dispute that, particularly at the early part of this year in March, their feminist declaration um, basically pushed again for lowering of the age for sex for minors. Um, and also because we've seen in through schools that we are getting a grooming of children at a very a young age for the programs that are introducing through the schools, like your SAFE program and a whole list of other ones, which I will list in the um, you know the comment sections that go with these video cast things. And so you can check for yourself and you can check everything I'm saying and please do, just don't take it on faith. Check it out and see if what I'm saying has got actual substance to it. So, you know, and if you find a flaw in it, fine, go ahead and tell me. Um, in Australia, members who are, uh, uh, are members of ILGA, ILGA Oceania, because they're everywhere, is ACOM which is the largest trans lobby that run the Pride and Diversity Inclusion Audits and they also, also includes the New South Wales LGBT Legal and Equality Australia, another influential trans lobby. Okay, and then we've got Thomson Reuters. Thomson Reuters, uh, you may not know, is one of the world's largest media conglomerates um, and they helped with Denton's to put together a handbook we call it a handbook we call it the Denton's handbook you no longer find it on their site uh, but we all saved it um, and I'll put the link of it below but they gave marketing tips social media marketing tips etc to um, the activists things like overstate hate crimes to trans uh, provide a narrative of vulnerable community if you don't let this young person transition they'll suicide they are the most marginalized people in the world Get on board technology companies like Netflix, etc., to tell stories that have sympathetic narratives of people only trying to authentically be who they are by changing their appearance to something that they're not, you know. Uh, and um, make sure you avoid uh, press coverage. You know, people like Bernard Land of Australian are definitely people you want to avoid uh, because he's on it. Um, that kind of thing. And there's other social media tactics, which is, you know, doxing, bullying, yelling, threatening, death threats, all that kind of stuff also tend to go along with that stuff because you're, you're calling everybody who's on board with us an ally, which automatically means anyone who's not, it's going to be considered an enemy. So let's talk about Dentons. They're a really significant um, player because they're the ones who created the goals that need to be put in place into the laws of each country. Um, what you needed to do to make this happen so that you've got a solid, um, you've got you've got ongoing business for the pharmaceutical industries, the medical industries, gender clinics, rural hospitals, that sort of thing. So um, they're a significant product enabler because they, their, their job is to remove the legal barriers for transitioning youth, which is important to their clients, striker, etc. And they're a mentor and investor uh, and a resource for LGBTQI activists, like they go free pro bono um, legal advice to LGBTQ to LGBTQIA activists. Um, you know who are the ones who sell the branding messages of the pharmaceutical industry. Here in Australia, Dentons is in every layer of government, from the uh, federal, state, and at the Attorney Generals. And they you can see they're in Australia, they're in Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, Brisbane, and they're in all the major sectors of corporate world as well. So extremely influential. Okay. Um, for your reference, I've listed those goals and strategies and a link to that handbook again in that comment section underneath the video um, in the following three slides. But I do want to cover it because these are the things that you need to pay attention to. I have put it in another video, but it bears repeating. What are the goals that 
they are putting into law. And when, when trans activists are talking about trans rights, when you first hear it, you think, oh, you must be talking about discrimination and not being bet upon and not being given access to jobs or things like that, which everybody has a right to. Everyone's covered. No, that's not what they're talking about. Trans rights they're talking about are these goals. That's what they're talking about. Okay. So one of the goals is self-ID and there's no requirement for any changes to be made. So if you're a guy with a beard and all your kit and caboodle and a mustache and whatever, you can just declare yourself a woman and that's it. You know, you don't need to go in through surgery or medical diagnosis or any legal oversight whatsoever. They want that self-diagnosis. Um, and this, yeah, and the relationships or any kind of negative impact of doing any kind of change, though, like just calling yourself a woman. Say, for example, you're you're married and your wife doesn't want to be married to what's called a woman. Um, they'd like to remove um, the right to divorce on the basis of that person's change. Okay, they want to make um, self ID to be quick, inexpensive and really as much as possible to be achieved through just declaring yourself to be a woman, okay? And the important stuff around the youth transition industry, which I'm keenly focused on, is removing parental authority. So removing parental consent to medical and social transitioning to the appearance of the opposite sex and all that that entails, um, that's a goal. Removing parental consent to the legal recognition of being a minor, in schools in Australia at the moment, they've brought up this new term called mature minor that the teachers and people who assist the teachers were those coming out of the um, the LGBTQIA associations, you know, like Rainbow Health and the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, um, assist in confirming that this person, this young person under 18, under 14, etc., is actually a mature minor and capable of making decisions to do to socially and medically transition even without parental consent and even without parental knowledge keeping that system on the other one is um the first steps is um is one around the birth certificates the first step is having adults having the right to change their sex on or change their gender or change you can't change sex rationally realistically you can't but change their sex on uh, gender on their birth certificates but the next step what they're really going for is they want to remove um, the um, the sex or gender on the birth certificate altogether delay it for a month delay it to 18 years something like that okay then they want to have a um, uh, a recognition of a third gender in other words non-binary which is neither male or female or um, call it queer, uh, which many straight people are calling themselves queer these days. And that reason why is because um, the non-binary and the queer group do um, sometimes do microtransactions of cross-sex hormones like testosterone and whatever the female hormone is, or whatever it is. Um, and that's a, that's a market, you know. And gender confirmation treatments, when you do any kind of transitioning and take any kind of drugs, surgeries, whatever, you want to have the state pay for it. You want to have the public taxpayer pay for it. So that means if it's a less cost, you know, your market grows more because there's removing barriers of cost. And lastly, the most scary one is, um, well, not last, there probably a few more here, but anyway, um, is to put heavy sanctions on anyone who doesn't recognize somebody's gender or anyone who speaks against gender identity ideology. So, for example, in New York, there's a fine of $275,000 for misgendering someone. And in February, what's kicking in with Victoria is that you'll have a committee, not that isn't invited, that isn't been voted on, that will be the judge and jury and decide of who is um, breaching this gender identity ideology. Um, and significant fines around $200,000 and dollars or um, five years in jail or for companies up to a million dollars or so and 10 years in jail um, with, an, a, with a definition of gender that makes absolutely no sense, that's tautological, that's circular, so that they are the only ones in the position to say what it means. And that's a scary, 
scary as hell situation that Australia's got into that is has huge ramifications on free speech and a heavy uh, march into authoritarianism based around an ideology or a non-godless religion, really. Plus that, they put in a whole bunch of strategies that they recommended to the youth, which was target youth politicians, make relationships with them, demedicalize the campaign, like um, when there's huge, when they make, um, uh, do surgery for neo penises and neo vaginas, they take out lobs of flesh from your arms and your thighs or what you've got left of a penis if you're on puberty blockers, whatever, to craft these things, which penises drop off because they, they're not an organ. There's just a piece of flesh attached and sewn on. And then vaginas need to be pumped open. They grow hair inside them and all holes. They're not normal, you know. Um, get on board techno um, companies like Netflix to tell sympathetic stories about people who are trying to be authentically who they are by changing themselves to the appearance of who they're not, you know. Always use human rights as a campaign, so that's why you're always seeing, hearing trans rights or human rights as a chant and mantra. And why you always get the chants and mantras is because they say no debate, no compromise, work together, collaborate, etc. But do things urgently, so no debate, no compromise, don't hear anything, so all you're doing is hearing chants, trans woman, a woman chant, trans rights, uh, human rights chant, that sort of thing. That's all coming from the Denton's Handbook as well. Okay, so Denton, as I mentioned, it set up a, a number of legal services free in um, Sydney, for example. We've got one over in the Inner West, and I think they opened one over in the um, King's Cross in the red light area. Exclusive, and I'll comment that over here we have a, a clinic called Feminist Legal Clinic that provides free pro bono services to females, including trans men, because they're females. Um, and just recently, the Sydney City Council, they took away their measly $9,000, which provided rent for them, because they said they were exclusive of trans women who are women, which they're not. And they also... Uh, gave, however, $500,000 to the LGBTQTIA, and I'm gay, and I am not for this, they gave it to the LGBTQTIA to run a World Pride Day, where they invited a speaker from ILGA World, associated and affiliated with pedophilia. And do understand something, that this does have an influence. In the schools, and I'll provide links here, there are practices that most parents are not aware of that's happening, such as um, talking about anal sex to kids under 11 years old and role plays around cunning leanness and that other thing that people do, the fellatio, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Where do you think this is coming from? The grooming of young people on sexual activities and acts. Think it through. So let's talk about the major um, trans lobby that's local. It is kind of the um, Australia's Stonewalls 2.0. Um, they're an affiliated with Stonewall. They have adopted many of the practices of Stonewall. They have adopted their diversity and championship program, which they call the diversity and inclusion audits or pride and franchise. And they assist in training um, activists in the local, uh, locally in Australia. They do marketing promoting of gender identity ideolo ideology. They've got strong ties to the pharmaceutical industry here in Australia. They are a member of ILGA World, therefore they get funded by the Arcus Foundation, you know, which is supported, of course, by the Stryker Corporation, a huge pharmaceutical giant, which I've mentioned. They run TransHub.org, which is a site aimed at transitioning socially, medically, surgically minors. The pharmaceutical industries profit from sponsoring ACON's promotion of the gender identity ideology because it helps to promote their products. Can I remind you? Puberty blockers. We should not be used. The three ones that we use over here, I can't pronounce them. I'll stick them in a link. But they are recommended not to be used by people who are seriously ill with cancer, endometriosis, and other things like that, for no more than five to six months. 
but it's recommended for um, 10 year olds for uh, five to six years who are healthy. Okay. Hormones, cross sex hormones, castration, double mastectomy, facial reconstructions, and the neogenitalia fashion from skin grafts. They're all into that. Transhub.org is, in effect, a marketing arm and a gateway for young people to find all that kind of information, being sold on it, access to gender clinics, who are the doctors that will transition, where do they get the products, where do they get, the, um, where do they get their um, services. I'll put a link to Kit Kowalski's um, video on puberty blockers. It's only short, but it's brilliant. Please look at it to see what they're marketing on their um, trans hub site. So if you are an LGBTQI activist and you want to see how your country is performing to the goals that you've, you're going for, then just go to Wikipedia and type in transgender goals in your country. Scotland, Ireland, UK, Canada, America, Australia, New Zealand, wherever. You're going to find a chart like this and you'll notice that it's got the goals that um, Dentons has said them to go for. A number of goals are just squished into the last column, which is anti-discrimination laws concerning gender identity. They just generally call it trans rights. Um, they don't spell it out, obviously. That would be bloody stupid. Um, but they can track what it is. They do know what they're talking about in their networks and their WhatsApps and their, you know, all their kind of communication tools. So those are the red areas that they are working on at the moment. Of course, they are working on getting conversion therapy bans through all the states. And, um, and they're following the gold standard of Victoria, which means heavy, heavy punitive damages for anyone who is speaking against the gender identity ideology. So that's the end of part two. Um, part three, I want to specifically focus on the tools of gender identity ideology, which is the conversion therapy bans, which are anything but, and the diversity inclusion audits that are, are being used to track compliance to the gender identity ideology in schools, universities, government and corporate world. Please check out my notes and I'll remind you, if you haven't watched that first video, go back and watch it please. Uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye.